Hello and welcome to Hello. the For We Are Many podcast. Today we are doing part four. That doesn't sound right. Yeah, part four. I thought we did more of that. I guess I guess that about checks out, honestly, with the amount of it we've gotten done. <clears throat> but uh, we will be reading um soul on ice by eldridge cleaver um kind of talking about the subject material and uh adding our own thoughts to it as we go uh, we're using the audio book on youtube from exam info um we'll be showing the video as we um play the audio book and we will also put the link in the description or in the comments, I should say. And if you give me just a second here, I will forward to you the link for the free PDF that I'm using um, that you can just download on your phone or tablet, and we can link that in the description too. Sounds good to me. All right, sending that your way now. I'm just doing my last little bit of... Uh, group sharing indeed of course i'm not going all out so we don't get you know the stream pulled again right. anyway um so we are starting at the chapter a day in Folsom prison um and i will put the link in the comments and um we'll just get this underway Day in Folsom Prison. Folsom Prison, September 19th, 1965. My day begins officially at 7 o'clock when all inmates are required to get out of bed and stand before their cell doors to be counted by guards who walk along the tier saying, 1, 2, two. However, I never remain in bed. I'm usually up by 5.30. The first thing I do is make up my bed. Then I pick up all my books, newspapers, etc. off the floor of my cell and spread them over my bed to clear the floor for calisthenics. In my cell, I have a little stool on which I lay a large plywood board about two and a half by three feet, which I use as a typing and writing table. At night, I load this makeshift table down with books and papers. And when I read at night, I spill things all over the floor. When I leave my cell, I set this board loaded down on my bed so that if a guard comes into my cell to search it, he will not knock the board off the stool, as has happened before. Still in the nude, the way I sleep, I go through my routine. Knee bends, butterflies, touching my toes, squats, windmills. I continue for about a half an hour. Sometimes, if I have something I want to write or type so that I can mail it that morning, I forgo my calisthenics. But this is unusual. We are required if we want our mail to go out on a certain day to have it in the mailbox by about 8 o'clock. When we leave our cells at 7.30 to go to breakfast, we pass right by the mailbox and drop in our mail on the way to the mail hall. Usually by the time I finish my calendar, trustee, we call him tear tender or key man, comes by and fills my little bucket with hot water. We don't have hot running water ourselves. Each cell has a small sink with a cold water tap a bed, a locker, a shelf or two along the wall, and a commode. The trustee has a big bucket with a long spout like the ones people use to water their flowers, only without the sprinkler. He pokes the spout through the bars and pours you about a gallon of hot water. My cell door doesn't have bars on it. It is a solid slab of steel with 58 holes in it 
about the size of a half dollar and a slot in the center at eye level about an inch wide and five inches long the trustee sticks the spout through one of the little holes and pours my hot water and in the evening the guard slides my mail into me through the slot through the same slot the convicts pass newspapers books candy and cigarettes to one another when the guard has mail for me he stops at the cell door and calls my name and I recite my number A29498 to verify that I am the right cleaver when I get mail I avert my eyes so I can't see who it's from then I sit down on my bed and peep at it real slowly like a poker player peeping at his cards I can feel when I'm from you and when I'm your name on the envelope I let out a big yell it's like having four aces but if the letter is not from you it's like having two deuces a three a four and a five all in scrambled suits a bum kick nothing what is worse is when the guard passes my door without pausing I can hear his keys jingling if he stops at my door the keys sound like Christmas bells ringing but if he keeps going they just sound like keys I live in the honor block in the other blocks the fronts of the cells consist of nothing but bars when I first moved into the honor block I didn't like it at all the cell seemed made for a dungeon the heavy steel doors slammed shut with a clang of finality that chilled my soul the first time that door closed on me I had the same wild hysterical sensation I felt years ago at San Quentin when they first locked me in solitary for the briefest moment I felt like yelling out for help and it seemed that in no circumstances would I be able to endure that cell all in that split second I felt like calling out to the guards pleading with them to let me out of the cell begging them to let me go promising them that I would be a good boy in the future but just as quickly as the feeling came it went and I felt that people I felt that I could endure anything everything even the test of being broken on the rack I've been in every type of cell they have in the prisons of California and the door to my present cell seems the most cruel and ugly of all however I have grown to like this door when I go out of my cell I can hardly wait to get back in to slam that cumbersome door and hear the sharp click as the trustee snaps the lock behind me the trustees keep the keys to the cells of the honor block all day relinquishing them at night and to get into your cell all you have to do is round up the trustee in charge of your tear once inside my cell I feel safe I don't have to watch the other convicts anymore or the guards in the gun towers if you live in a cell with nothing but bars on the front you cannot afford to relax someone can walk along the tear and throw a Molotov cocktail in on you before you know it something I've seen happen in San Quentin whenever I live in one of those barred cells I keep a blanket within easy reach in case of emergency to smother a fire if need be paranoia yes but it's the least one can do for oneself in my present cell with its impregnable door I don't worry about sabotage although if someone wanted to ban off they could get something out so I mean like what he's describing is so almost dystopic yeah for fucking real I, I mean but he's got a point there. I mean, especially in the time and place, prisons weren't as secure as they are now. I've heard stories about 
things like he's describing in San Quentin. Right. Um, so, I, I mean, is it paranoia or is it preparedness? I think it's preparedness because that's one thing. It, when it comes down to it, if somebody wants to put a hit on your ass, it's easier to do so with you in prison than not because you're sequestered to a fucking cell. There ain't fuck all you can do about it if somebody, you know, manages to get at you like that with a Molotov cocktail. Right. And you sure as hell ain't gonna fucking shank somebody through a steel door. Right. <laughs> right. They were clearly not letting him out into Gen Pop from the sounds of it, like at all. Um, which might have worked in his favor in that case that somebody can't just shank him. But Well, I mean, I, I think that he's talking about the difference in the cells between San Quentin and Folsom. Yeah. And exactly, Nathan, that's kind of what I was getting at. Nathan said, um, it's the same as staying armed with today's political divide. It's preparedness. Yep. He knows what threat is lurking there and how to fucking address it. He's just making sure he's ready in case. Yeah, for sure. And uh, hi, Natalie. Nice to see you. Hi, Natalie. Uh, since we've got most of the regulars in here now, I, I do want to point out that today we posted a, uh, what was it, like a 15 or 16 minute video on revolutionary optimism. And we also posted a written version of that article today. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it's on forwearemany.org. Um and let us know what you think of it. Let us know if there's something you think that we should add to it or something we may have overlooked. Anyway, well, back to the tech. To be fair, I overlooked that moment I wanted to bring up the Kwame Ture co quote of um, unity represents what we stand for, not what we stand against. Because that right there is revolutionary optimism remembering what we're trying to build right we're all never never lose sight of the goal right we're all completely <laughs> fucking aware of how brutal we are. brutal i can't talk reality is right now um it's a matter of keeping that awareness of what we're trying to build and focusing your energy there where we can actually create change create the things that we want to see happening in the fucking world we have that ability Anyway, I digress. Back to the... T well, after I finish my stenics and the hot water has arrived, I take me a bird, jailbird, bath in the little sink. It's usually about 6 a.m. by then. From then until 7.30... When we are let out for breakfast, I clean up my cell and try to catch a little news over the radio. So they are getting out. Radio? Each cell has a pair of earphones with only two channels on it. The programs are monitored from the radio room. The radio schedule is made up by the radio committee, of which I am a member. At 7.30, breakfast. From the mess hall every day except Saturday, my day off, I go straight to the bakery, change into my white working clothes, and that's me until about noon. From noon, I am free until 3.20. That was air quotes. Evening mandatory lockup when we are required again to stand before our cell doors and be counted. There is another count at 6.30 p.m three times every day without fail. When I'm through working in the bakery, I have the choice of one, going to my cell, two, staying in the dining room to watch TV, three, going down to the library, or four, going out to the yard to walk around, sit in the sun, play some funny games, chess, marbles, Horseshoes, handball, baseball, 
shuffleboard, beating on the punching bag, basketball, talk, TV, paddle tennis, watching the other convicts who are watching other convicts. When I first came to Folsom, I was astonished to see the old grizzled cons playing marbles. The marble players of Folsom are legendary throughout the prison system. I first heard about them years ago. There is a sense of ultimate defeat about them. Some guy might boast about how he is going to get out next time and stay out. And someone will put him down by saying he'll soon be back. Playing marbles like a has-been. It never was. Blasted back into childhood by a crushing defeat to his final dream. The marble players have the game down to an art. And they play all day long fanatically absorbed in what they are doing. If I have a cell partner who knows the game, I play him chess now and then, maybe a game each night. I have a chess set of my own and sometimes, when I feel like doing nothing else, I take out a little envelope in which I keep a collection of chess problems clipped from newspapers and run off one or two. I have never been on to one of these games. I am seldom able to play a game of chess out on the yard. Whenever I go out on the yard these days, I'm usually on my way to the library. Almost forgot to unmute it. And I think that that, uh, you know, that desire for learning um, is, is probably parts of his character that made him a prime candidate for the Minister of Information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I mean, you, you kind of have to have that hunger for knowledge. Um, <laughs> right. But um, anyway, like it's, it's encouraging, I guess, to see that you know, when everybody else has given up and are just playing stupid games to pass the time, he's like, no, I need to fucking learn. I'm right. not going to be like, I'm not going to be like that. I'm not coming back. <laughs> right. Not planning on being one of the ones playing marbles for decades. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Fuck. Anyway. Back to the text. On the yard, there is a little shack off to one corner, which is the office of the Inmates Advisory Council, IAC. Sometimes I visit the shack to shoot the bull and get the latest drawings, news, and sometimes I go out to the weightlift, strip down to and push a little iron for a while and soak up the sun. At 325 lockup, stand for count. After count, off to the evening meal. Back to the cell. Stand for count at 630. After the 630 count, we are all let out of our cells, one tier at a time. For showers, to exchange dirty socks and towels for clean ones. A haircut, then back to the cell. I duck this crush by taking my showers in the bakery. At night, I only go to exchange my linen. In the honor block, we are allowed to come out after the 6.30 count every Saturday. Sunday and Wednesday night to watch TV until 10 o'clock before we are locked up for the night. The only time I went out for TV was to dig the broads on Shindig and Hollywood a go-go. But those programs don't come on anymore. I've never heard of either of them. We recently got the rule changed so that on TV nights, those in the honor block can type until 10. It used to be that no typing was allowed after 8. I am very pleased to be able to get in that extra typing time. 
I can write you more letters. So those you you literally just type in yourself. Like well in lock, I guess, not in the cell, but I didn't I didn't know that. So like he didn't like write this by hand while he was in prison. He typed this. Right. That's kind of wild. Old school typewriters. Right. Right. I don't know why that was so surprising. I mean, but it's not like people are generally just typing in prison, I guess. <laughs> Well, now they use computers. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, though. Do you get a computer in prison? Well, not a personal one, but most of them do have a room where there's a few computers you can use if you need to, say, do research for your case or anything else along those lines. Um, so I imagine they... That's fair. If you use them for writing letters and stuff, too, if they want to. But Fair just, enough. Anywho. I go out of my cell after the 6.30 count to attend the weekly IAC meetings. These meetings adjourn promptly at 9 o'clock. On Saturday mornings, my off day, I usually attend the meetings of the Gavel Club. But this past Saturday, I was in the middle of my last letter to you, and I stole away to my cell. I enjoyed it so much that I am tempted to put the gavel club down. Hope that I don't I am gaining some valuable experience and technique in public speaking. On the average, I spend approximately 17 hours a day in my cell. I enjoy the solitude. The only drawback is that I am unable to get the type of reading material I want. And there is hardly anyone with a level head to talk to. There are quite a few guys here who write. It seems that every convict wants to. Some of them have managed to sell a piece here and there. They have a writer's workshop which meets in the library under the wing of our librarian. I've never had a desire to belong to this workshop. Partly because of my dislike for the attitude of the librarian and partly because of the phony, funny-style convicts. Mostly, I suppose, it's because the members of the workshop are all white and all sick when it comes to color. They're not all sick, but they're not for real. They're fair-weather types, not even as lukewarm as good white liberals, and they conform to the Mississippi atmosphere prevalent here in Folsom. Blacks and whites do not fraternize together in comfort here. Harry Golden's concept of vertical integration and horizontal segregation about covers it. The whites want to talk with you out on the yard or at work, standing up, but they shun you when it comes to sitting down. For instance, up for child, the to the mess halls are integrated. But once inside the mess hall, blacks sit at the tables by themselves, and whites sit with themselves or the Mexicans. So we see that a lot yeah. still uh, in the system today, and it's kind of almost encouraged in some jails and prisons. Um, or, you know, like this mentality is fostered by um, the guards themselves in some cases. <clears throat> And um, that's that's why I think organizing the lumpen proletariat or organizing in prisons is important. It really is. Um, Natalie said, I'm pretty sure now some well-funded prisons have non-mandatory classes available to earn a college degree. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But yeah, to be fair, I think a lot of the situations or the in, the environmental, you know, how do I want to put this? 
all of that pressure of the things that are going on there, that that division is pushed there too, even more so than it is in the general populace, because they'd have their hands really fucking full if all the prisoners united. Exactly. So they keep them splintered into, you know, well, and, and of course it's criminal organizations primarily too. Right. Um, you know, which just kind of keeps the revolving American prison system working. <clears throat> right. Anyway, it's fucked. I see we have almost as many viewers on Twitch as we do on Facebook tonight. That's pretty cool. Sweet. Hello. Hello, comrades. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, We've hello, been... whoever you are on Twitch. <laughs> yeah. We've got a few new people in the comments from Facebook, too. We've got Valerian and Candence. Uh, thank you guys for joining us, too. Absolutely. That's what's up. I dig it. Uh, feel free to add your your thoughts in the comments, too. Because, I mean, the whole point of this is to read it as a group. And if something sticks out to you that doesn't necessarily, like, something that we miss or something that we may not have context <laughs> to that you do, feel free to speak up and let us know. Right. There's this one Jewish stud out of New York who fell out of Frisco. He thinks he is another Lenny Bruce. In point of fact, he is funny and very glib. And I dig rapping, talking with him. He's a hype, but he is very down with the current scene. Says that he lived in North Beach and all that. And that he has this chick who writes him who is a member of the Dubois Club in Frisco. Well, this cat is well read, and we exchange reading material. He, he says that at home, he has every copy of the Realist up to the time of his fall. The Evergreen Review kills him. We communicate pretty well, and I know that Stud is not a racist, but he is a conformist, which in my book is worse, more dangerous than an out-and-out -out foe. So this is kind of echoing the, the same the same mentality that, that Malcolm X had um, and that MLK had as like the idea of the white liberal being more dangerous than the Klan. Right. It's one of those things of standing in silence only fucking supports <laughs> those doing the harm. Exactly. So I just wanted to point out that parallel, though, because that was um, that's something that Malcolm X talked about. That's something that MLK talked about. And um, we're seeing the continuation of that thought. Absolutely. I see that we have a bunch of comments. <laughs> I was just scrolling through those too. <laughs> um, John yeah. said, one thing we all need, it's not going to show the whole comment, okay. One thing we all need to understand is that crime and criminal industries are a function of capitalism's dysfunction. As people are economically pressed into poverty, survival can depend more and more on a reduced scope of choices, which leads to utilizing alternative activities that are deemed as criminal, such as trafficking drug, drugs, drugs for the people who have money, um, those still included in the economic system. This needs to be addressed and remembered. Racism creates the illusion that these are bad actors when the fact these when the fact is these are forced on poor people of color and poor whites is a function of capitalism's dysfunction of exclusion. And uh yeah. Well said. The, the, yeah, I mean, that's a mouthful, but you're fucking spot on with all of it. Um, and, and I don't know if at this point in his political awakening, if, if Eldridge Cleaver was staunchly anti-capitalist, but I mean, as we can see, just with what we've read today, even, um, he's definitely well on that path. Um, can't, 
What was that? Absolutely. <laughs> um, Candon said, it's crazy seeing racism from both sides as a child. My little sister is mixed, unlike me and my brother, who were raised by my grandparents until grandpa went to prison. Seeing my grandma and grandpa treat my sister different never registered. But my dad never treated us different. He stood up in a world against and against him and raised two white kids who had behavioral issues. Man, I love my dad. He definitely saw the light in me and knew I was going to be someone someday. That's what's up. I'm glad he was there for you when things went south with your grandpa. <clears throat> Yeah. All right. Uh, back to the text. The other day, we were talking about the free speech movement. He was reading a book by Paul Goodman, Growing Up Absurd, which he had with him. We were very hung up talking, and then it was time for lunch. We got in line and continued our conversation. He was trying to convince me that the whole FSM was predicated on the writings of Paul Goodman, and that he had heard with his own ears Mario Savio say as much. Then all of a sudden, I noticed this cat grow leery and start looking all around. He made me nervous. I thought maybe someone was trying to sneak up on us with a knife or something. When he kept doing this, I asked him what the fuck was the matter with him. He turned real red and said that he just remembered that he had to talk to another fellow. I dug right away what the kick was, so I said later, and he split. I'm used to such scenes, having a 400 year heritage of learning to roll with that type of punch. I saw him in the mess hall looking very pushed out of shape. I had to laugh at him. I felt that he was probably thinking that if the whites put the blacks in the gas chambers, they might grab him too if he was with me. That thought tip peeping around like a ferret. One of his points of indignation is that he says he will never forgive Israel for kidnapping and killing Eichmann. And he gets mad at me because I take Israel's side just to keep the conversation alive. Too much agreement kills a chat. What really bugs him is when I say that there are many blacks who if they were in the position would do a little rounding up of the Eichmann types in America. A few days later he told me, you saw it through me the other day didn't you? I see through you every day. I told him. He looked as if he expected or wanted me to hit him or something. I told him that he was good for nothing but to be somebody's jailhouse wife and he laughed. <laughs> then launched into a Lenny Bruce type monologue. My own reaction is to have as little as possible to do with the whites. I have no respect for a duck who runs up to me on the yard all buddy buddy and then feels obliged not to sit down with me. It's not that I'm dying to sit with him either, but there's a principle involved which cuts me deeply. Right. Talk about hypocrisy. You should see the library. We are allowed to order from the state library only nonfiction and law books. Of the law books, we can only order books containing court opinion. We can get any decision of the California District Court of Appeals, the California Supreme Court, the U.S. District Courts, the Circuit Courts, and the U.S. Supreme but books of an explanatory nature are prohibited. I just want to interject real quick to say that's fucked up. But that is. Like, that means they wouldn't even be able to get a copy of Black's Law Dictionary, I wouldn't think, because that's not court opinion. Right, no, it's, 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 it's explanatory. Right. Holy not, shit. So, like, how are they in earnest supposed to learn anything from these law books? Right. Like, what if there's not a previous case to be looking at as a source for information for how shit would apply in yours? 
there's not going to be a court decision on record that is available for you to pull if it don't fucking exist. So what are you just left with? No fucking resources to even use to learn about the laws that would apply in your case, you know, um, that's fucked. It's a limitation that shouldn't be there. Well, yeah. And just like they can't, of the law books, we can only order books containing court opinions. So, like, they can't get the law books themselves, just the opinions on the right. laws. Right. That, on that top of that, right. they can't have a, a vital resource like Black Black's Law Dictionary to understand what the laws and the opinions mean in the first place. Right. To be able to even learn how to speak legally. And yes, Valerian, you are yeah. right on the money here. The entire point is to prohibit inmates from accessing legal information. Uh huh. That's a human rights violation right there. And uh, Natalie, I th- think you are remembering correctly. I think Eldridge Cleaver is supported Reagan. Um, if memory serves right. So that, that can be problematic, but that was also decades after this, a couple of decades after this, you know? Right. Um, so, I mean, we're yet to learn what exactly shifted any of his political perspectives there, too. And yes, Valerian, you are absolutely 100% correct there. But like the legal system, it's not always applied unilaterally. <sighs> That's. I don't know why I haven't had this up. It's the chat. Oh, yeah. The chat's know. actually been active, so like, why am I not using it? Um, but right. John shared a link into the comments. Uh, that's a New York Times article from 1998 when Eldridge Cleaver passed away. Um, but yes, the headline is Eldridge Cleaver, Black Panther Who Became GOP Conservative. Right. It makes me wonder why, really, truly. I mean, me too. But I mean, I also wonder about uh, was it was it Huey P. Newton? Like all of a sudden was anti-gun. Was it Huey or was it Bobby? It was one of the two. It might have been Bobby. But I I mean, either way, the, the, the point is, is a lot of shit seemed to have gone down with the Panther leadership. Um towards the end of the original Black Panther party. Right. And we all know why. Cointel Pro, for one. Yeah. That's a big factor. That was their whole goal there. To impact it the way they did. That angers me. Dude. How much more could have been achieved by now if it wasn't for Cointel Pro? And other things like that having such a harmful effect on the movement. Um, John said, I think Cleaver was adding his influence into conservative areas. And, you know, if that's what he was doing, then I can understand that because when it comes down to actually discussing things, and, you know, especially when it comes to um, labor, you know, that class struggle is across the board. You've got Republicans, too, that are able to relate there and you can at least engage and discuss ideals and uh, open their eyes to some things and radicalize some of them, too. You know, that that's actually something we've been discussing lately. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that piece from Rev Left Radio about that, like, check that out, um, about why it's important to actually wield an influence in right-wing spaces and possible to do so, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the point is, is that there's going to be common ground. Stand up on that common ground from there. Yep. Like... When we say meet them where they are, we're not saying, like, team up with fascists. Obviously, you're not going to change your minds anyway. But, like, more more libertarian-minded, you know, right-leaning people um, often have a lot more in common with us than they do with the fascists. But they still 
right. get won over by the fascists if we don't try. Right. Because you got to remember, too, when it comes to political education, that's really not a fucking thing in this country. It, it, it does not go deep enough, does not cover enough, and it's not honest. So a lot of people still have blinders on and aren't even aware of it. So that's a, a teaching moment to, to bring up some fucking, you know, educational resources and let people know about certain things and how they're done. CIA actually developed gang stalking to combat the Black Panthers and other groups that are similar, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Never underestimate the Empire's ability to bribe, co opt, and assimilate the disenfranchised. It's an art long perfected, yes. Yeah, well said there. I mean, it. it's still. It still happens. I mean, look at uh, look at the organization Black Lives Matter, the the, the fundraising organization, the funnel money to Democrats. Yeah, like th- yeah. the nine hundred dollars. If if that number is correct, I forget where I got it from, but if that number is correct, imagine what that money could have done for a community, right? Natalie said, you know, Republicans can be deceptive and try to talk black, indigenous, and people of color into believing the Dems are trying to keep them oppressed. One point of why going Republican Party, I think, is an influence. And it's like, they are two heads of the same fucking neoliberal monster. And both of them want to keep you oppressed. Because they depend on that shit. Well, and the system itself isn't going to let any real outsiders in anyway. I mean, even if, um, even if like a socialist party came out of nowhere and started winning a bunch of elections, you know, damn well that the system would protect itself. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Back to the text. Many convicts who do not have lawyers are forced to act in propria persona. They do all right, but it would be much easier if they could get books that show them how properly to plead their case, how to prepare their petitions and briefs. This is a perpetual sore point with the Folsom Prison Bar Association, as we call ourselves. All of the novels one needs to read unavailable. You send for them. I asked him once if he had read a certain book. Oh, yes, he exclaimed. What did you think of it? I asked. Absolutely marvelous, he said. How about letting me send to the state library for it? I asked. No. Books that one wants to read so bad that it is a taste in the mouth, like Calvin C. Herndon's Sex and Racism in America, he won't let you have. The warden says, no sex is his perpetual squelch. Oh my God. There is a book written by a New York judge which gives case histories of prostitutes. The authors explore why white prostitutes, some of them from the deepest south, had Negroes for pimps, and I wanted to reread it. No sex, said the librarian. He is indifferent to the fact that it is a matter of life and death to me. I don't know how he justifies this, because you can go over to the inmate canteen and buy all the Orient pot boiling anti literature that has ever been written. But everything that is happening today is verboten. I've been dying to read Norman Mailer's An American Dream, but that too is prohibited. You can have readers digest, boy, not 
I have long waited to file suit in federal court for the right to receive <laughs> Playboy magazine. Do you think you have to finance such an issue? I think some very nice ideas will be liberated. The library does have a selection of very solid material. Things done from 10 years ago all the way back to the Bible. But it is unsatisfactory to a stud who is trying to function in the last half of the 20th century. Go down there and try to find Hemingway, Miller, Camus, Sartre, Baldwin, Henry Miller, Terry Southern, Julian Mayfield, Bellow, William Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, Herbert Gold, Robert Gover, J. O. Killens, etc. No action. They also have this sick thing going on when it comes to books by and about Negroes. Robert F. Williams' book, Negroes with Guns, is not allowed anymore. I ordered it from the state library before it was too popular around here. I devoured it and let a few friends read it before the librarian dug it and put it on the blacklist. Once I ordered two books from the inmate canteen with my own money. When they arrived here from the company, the librarian impounded them, placing them on my property, the same as they did. I want to devote my time to reading and writing, with everything else secondary, but I can't do that in prison. I have to keep my eyes open at all times, or I won't make it. There is always some madness going on, and whether you like it or not, you're involved. There is no choice in the matter. You cannot sit and wait for things to come to you. So I engage in all kinds of petty intrigue, which I found necessary to survival. It consumes a lot of time and energy, but... It is necessary. Yep. So, uh, I need to scroll back up. I scroll down to the next page. Um, I guess, like, to, to reflect on this chapter here, I just kind of want to, like, point out that we shouldn't all have to have experiences like this to sympathize with people who do. Right. These same kinds of conditions still exist today in prisons, especially in the United States. Yeah. And, um, like, yeah, you can get a college degree, but can you, like, you know, study revolutionary theory? I doubt it. Can, I, can you... Uh, You can get all the nonfiction you want, but are they able to access their law books and the books to decipher those? Right. right. Or or is it just a continuation of what you cut out for a moment? Oh, I was just saying, is, is it that or is it a continuation of what he's describing here? I mean, like... Are they, are prisoners today allowed these basic rights to knowledge or are they still being repressed like that? I don't know. That's worth looking into to find out though. It still doesn't show the whole comment, damn it. Uh, comparing English-speaking developed countries, the overall incarceration rate in the United States is 639 per 100,000 population of all ages as of 2018. That's of all ages. That includes your great-grandparents. That includes your newborn cousin. Right. Uh, the incarceration rate of Canada is 104 per 100,000. England and Wales is 130 per 100,000. And Australia is 160 per 100,000. So, like, to put this in, like, global numbers we have four percent of the world's overall population and over 25 percent of the world's prison population yeah that 
it's modern day slavery. Yep. Cause and I, I mean, even, even constitutionally, the 13th amendment yeah. banned slavery except for as the punishment of a crime. Yep. And that's people getting paid to fight fires in California. Or $2 an hour, maybe it is. But either way, it's slavery. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm scrolling I'm trying through. To, I, this next chapter is really long. So, I mean, I kind of feel like we should... Uh, Just Save call it for this piece. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next chapter, though, um, is initial reactions on the assassination of Malcolm X. And <clears throat> I'd kind of like to do a little bit of, of background research before we read this anyway, because remember, this is 1965. This is when Malcolm X was killed. There's been a lot of um, a lot of things learned since then. So I want to see what we know today versus his initial reactions. Right. Uh, uh, John posted an article in the comments here. Um, about the loophole that has preserved slavery more than 150 years after abolition. And, of course, that's what we were just talking about. The 13th Amendment itself um, allows slavery as the punishment of a crime. And that's still very the case today. Right. Um, Plantation so, of labor. Tomorrow, for all of our patrons, which if you would like to become a patron and, and be a part of tomorrow's uh, movie watch along, we will be watching Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, we're going to talk, I'm, I'm sure, a lot more about Fred Hampton's political work than the movie does. Um, yeah. Because understanding what he was doing is essential in understanding why the FBI thought he needed to be dead. Yep. Um, but yeah, we're going to have a pretty in-depth discussion during the movie tomorrow. That'll be at the usual showtime, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, and if you don't have uh, the money to uh, become a patron, we can just message the page and let us know, and we'll put you in contact with someone who offered to sponsor five um, patrons. Yep. Um, yeah, that was really kind of Wade the other night, and uh, is much appreciated, you know? Yeah, for sure. That's some solidarity right there. It really is. Um, and words can't express the, the gratitude that we feel for that. Uh, that being said, I mean, we, we actually have had uh, some new... We had two new patrons last week, and... Well, I mean, it's been slowly creeping up, but um, it's nice to see other people uh, contributing because we've been paying quite a bit out of pocket for almost a year now. And uh, it helps a lot. That, that burden is definitely a lot less now than it was even two months ago. Right. Um, so if you are a patron though, and you want to join us for our Judas and the Black Messiah movie watch along tomorrow, which I'm going to make a whole post about that, um, on Facebook and, um, you know, try to make sure that everybody that wants to go has the opportunity to go. Um, oh, yeah. otherwise, if you are a patron, um, we will be sending you a message. If we don't have you on Facebook, it'll be on Patreon. So you're going to have to actually check your Patreon inbox. Um, but we'll, we will be sending 
uh, the link to the Zoom meeting about a half hour probably before we start the show. Uh, the show, the movie, whatever. You knew what I meant. <laughs> right. Won't be broadcasted. Not paying for the movie rights for that. Private Don't viewing. have the money to pay <laughs> for the movie rights. Right. Right. You cannot <laughs> afford that. <laughs> yeah, but for sure. You're private viewing. Exactly. And um, if you want to send a Patreon for that matter, the website is at patreon.com slash for we are many. Um, and uh, I also found out that the service that we use to host our podcasts is now offering video podcasts on Spotify. So if you generally watch our excuse me, if you generally listen to us instead of watching us, um, you'll actually be able to see us if you listen through Spotify. So that's also pretty cool. Hell yeah. I dig it. Especially when like we put the chat up here, you know, and right. (laughs) Yep. There's a lot of stuff going on visually that helps. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, Natalie, I've been waiting to see that for quite a while as well. Um, it's a great let's movie. Let's see what, it, what else it do we got? A little up? bit and cry, but yeah. Um, we also have uh, <laughs> Tuesday. We will be having our usual current event stream, also eight PM Eastern. And next Thursday, we will be back into Emma Goldman's Anarchism and Other Essays. That will be available, actually, for patrons tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, so also check your, your Patreon tomorrow for a link for that. I think that's all I got, though. Um, um, we've got the upcoming piece on Greenwood. Um, uh, the which- upcoming piece, Vicky's article on... Uh, the Ethan Crumbly shooting. Yep. Um, I believe she's working on one for the Starbucks strike. Was it? Well, for the Starbucks union, which I guess now that uh, the results for at least the first store are in, the first Starbucks in Buffalo, New York, voted to unionize, voted to unionize today. So that is a that is a victory for all workers, really. When we pull up the bottom, everybody rises. Yep. Oh, Natalie, yeah, we, we totally got that the first time. But yes, absolutely. Both Democrats and Republicans are corrupt and oppressive. And... Yep. I, I don't think anybody would have misunderstood that in the previous one, but, uh, you know, yeah, just in case anybody did. <laughs> Too yeah, I mean, honestly, at this, point, at, at this point, I would I would hope that uh, that's just implied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I yeah. suppose that's all I got same all right well uh make sure to subscribe to us on social media platforms um visit our website keep up to date with us for a patron actually log into your patreon so we can contact you um and there is a list of places you can find us I hope you all have a wonderful night, and thank you for your time.
Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Valerian. Glad you found us too. Oh, hi, Wayne. Wayne, get up here. 